Okay, so one thing we want to look at as a technical indicator is the actual participation in the market. And that participation we can measure by volume. So if the market volume increases or is considered above normal, then that would be considered uh, a strong market. And a weak market is considered uh, any market where the volume is below the average. So we can get an average volume for the market, and then we want to look at the, the day's volume compared to the average. So if you have a, a market where it goes up, but not a lot of people are involved in it, it's not as significant on the days the market goes up and a lot of people are involved in it. So it's really just the level of voting by people buying or selling stock. We look at this market volume to give us an idea of the commitment or the strength of the market. So if you have a market where the up days are very strong and the down days are very weak, you know that's a bull market. If we start seeing a market where the up days are very, very low volume and the down, day, the down days are very high volume, then that's going to be a, a, a more of a, a correction or a bear market. Now my uh, slides have stopped working. There we go. They're back. Okay. So, um, so if we look at the breadth of the market, uh, we're trying to look at the number of stocks that go up compared to the number of stocks that go down. So a strong market is when the advancing stocks outnumber the declining stocks. And of course, a weak market is the declining stocks outnumber the advancing stocks. And we can get that from Yahoo Finance. will give you the number of stocks moving higher, the number unchanged, and the number of the stocks moving lower. Now, the short interest uh, looks at the amount, the number of stocks that have been sold short for any given period of time. Uh, now, this, this is basically a measure. We, we've talked about this before. But if the short interest is increasing, then more people are expecting stock prices to go down. And if the short interest is decreasing, people are reversing their short positions. They're expecting the stock prices are going to go up. So it's sort of a signal of future market prices. So if short sales are high, um, so if short sales are high and going higher at a certain point, they kind of reach an all-time high. And that's going to guarantee that these people have to cover these short positions. In order to cover the short positions, you have to buy the stock back. So when you have very high short positions, it, it can mean that there's going to be future demand for the stock market or that stock because they're going to have to cover these positions to realize their gains. Um, it's, a, it's a measure of optimism or pessimism. So if in the weak market when the short sales are high, definitely it's a professional short sale or Professional people short stocks more often than the non-professional people because it's a little more sophisticated of a transaction to do. And so if the short interests start going up dramatically, then the professional investors are betting the stock market's going to go down. Because probably around 70-80% of all the short selling are done by professional traders who um, are dealing with large sums of money, work for institutions or mutual funds or hedge funds these different types of organizations. Typically, the herd or the newer or small investor, they don't have accounts that allow you to short sell because you have to actually designate your account, fill out additional paperwork, and qualify with a margin account to do a short sell, to have a short selling. Most accounts are just opened up for long positions. So it means a lot when we see this number changing in the overall landscape of the marketplace. Okay, so... If we talk about what, we, what I call the herd, which Wall Street calls the herd, these are um, every time we have a, a, a bull market, like we have now a, a five-year-old bull market, we get a whole new class of small investors that come into the market who invest money in the market. The market goes up. They make money. They put more money into the market, and they, have, they help fuel and uh, lengthen the bull market, these small investors. And while things are going good, they continue to pump money into the stock market. And we have an environment today where you can't earn interest at banks and you can't earn interest on treasury bills, anything significant. And stocks are really the only place to make a significant increase in your returns. 
then you're going to put more money in the stock market. However, we can track um, we can track what these 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 small investors, these novice investors, do by their odd lot trading. So they don't trade in 100, 500, 1,000 shares. They trade in 75 shares, 35 shares, 10 shares, 113 shares. They they buy generally odd lots. They're not they're not in the know. If you're a knowledgeable in the know investor, you always buy in, in round lots of 100 or multiples of 100. That's just something that signifies your you know it's sort of like a hidden code. If you know what you're doing, then you know enough to buy round lots all the time. If you're buying the odd lots. And, and a lot of the um, small investors would do re, re, reinvest their dividends and, and buy fractional shares and, and odd lots. So this is basically why we measure this. So the small novice and trader, they always make the wrong decision. They get emotional. They get scared. They pull out of their positions. Uh, so if the stock market, they're always buying high and selling low. So if they bought high at the end of the bull market and things start to go wrong, we're going to measure what they are doing and do the opposite. So right now, if the small investor, the herd, is buying stocks and pushing this, this bull market even higher, the, the institutional or the educated investors are noticing this and they've stopped buying or they started selling or short selling. And they do that their money comes out first, and then we'll see a significant decline in the market, and then the rest of the investors will pull out. So that's why we want to measure the volume of these small traders, because we want to do the opposite of them. If they're buying, we want to sell. If they're selling, we want to buy. So it assumes that the, you know, small traders will do the opposite of what they should do over time. So they panic and sell when markets are low, and they speculate and buy when markets are high. They just make the worst mistakes. Um, so in a bull market, uh, odd lot sales, um, odd lot sales significantly outnumber odd lot purchases. We know that at the end of a bull market, that's even more true, and we should start thinking about reducing our positions. And that's sort of what's happening now. We see not a lot of um, round lots being purchased. We see a lot of odd lots purchased, moving this market up. And we see, basically, it looks like the professional traders pull back. They wait for the small traders to push it back up when they're buying. Oh, it's on discount. Let me buy in, or I get a, a you know, I'm going to buy the dips. And then they kind of are easing out their positions as as the information comes in. They're not 100% sure what's going to happen, but they're kind of pulling back a little bit by being not fully invested 100% in stocks as they're waiting to see you know, what's happening in the broader context of the world and the economy. But the small investor doesn't do all that research. They just buy when they think the market is an opportunity. In the bear market, the odd lot purchases significantly outnumber the odd lot sales. So in the bear market, when things are going down, the small investors keep buying because it's on sale. Oh, my dress is on sale. It was $100 last week, and now it's 80 I'm going to Kohl's to buy it, and I have a 20% off coupon, and I have $10 in Kohl's cash. Because that's how the small investors think. When the stocks start going down in price, they say, oh, it's on sale, it's on discount, I can get it for a cheap price, you know. Um, but like they were saying in the guest lecture on, on Wednesday, you know, I heard a lot of students when I was here teaching in 2000 with Enron, and when that started going down, people, when it went from 80 to 60, there everybody was saying, buy it, buy it. It's on, oh, what a great company. I got to buy it. And then it went from 60 to 40. Oh, you got to get in. It's so cheap. It's going to have to go up. And then from 40 to 20, even more. And then, you know, you know, from 20 to $10, oh, it's a great investment. Now you can't lose any money. I mean, this stock all, went all the way down to zero. And small investors were buying it all the way down while the large investors had sold their positions and sold it short. And that's typically the same, same old story on Wall Street. And that's why, as uh, technical indicators, we can always count on these small investors to make the same mistakes. This is just an example of when we look at the stock market, and we can get this from Yahoo, the advancing stocks, the declining stocks, the unchanged, the new highs and lows. And then we can look at the, the volume up or down on each particular day to see what's more significant. And we can look at the upside volume versus the downside volume. And we can see... Um, light trading days and heavier trading days. The first, well, these are all different exchanges. 
And you can see how the New York Stock Exchange usually has the most shares traded on it. Okay. So if you look at the advanced decline line, it measures the difference between the stocks closing higher versus the stocks closing lower the previous day. And the difference is plotted on the chart. So if we basically um, 500 stocks closing higher minus 400 stocks closing lower, we have 100. And then we the next day, it could be two different numbers. Maybe we have 150. So we just plot it. So we could kind of plot this advanced decline line and use it as a, as, a, as a signal to whether buy or sell the market. So the bull market is when advances are outnumbering declines and we have an escalating amount of advancing stocks week after week, we know it's a bull market. And the bear market is when the declines start outnumbering the advances. So if we start seeing in any particular day there's more stocks declining than advancing and that's a trend continuing day after day, we know that we're, we're heading into a bear market. So we could look at these um, indicators to tell us generally where the market is moving. And if we look at the 52-week highs and new lows, if we go to um, Yahoo Finance and you want to click on um, market data and then stocks, and then... Okay. We have here the advances and declines. We have the fifth, we have the new highs and new lows. The new highs and the new lows, uh, and we could see that today there's a hundred new highs and fifty six new lows. So that's overall. Uh, a positive thing. But you see here at the volume, how it's only a million shares. And we saw on the other side, it was like 2.7 million. The volume is very low today. So that would kind of say, uh, although it's still early in the day, so we don't know what the total volume is going to be by the end of the day. But uh, this will give us an idea of how committed people are on these new highs and lows. Okay. But this is where you can get all the data, the advancing versus the declining stocks and the total issues even gives us some information on analysts expectations and the most frequently traded uh, stocks today all right so you can get this information every day and with the new highs and lows we want to measure the difference between the stocks that are reaching 52 week high versus the one reaching the 52 week low and we could plot that on a graph, and we can do it. We can do a moving average, and a moving average is basically we want to add 10 days worth of new highs and divide it by 10. So we kind of get like a, a little smoothing there, and we can do the same thing with the uh, the lows or the difference between the new high and the new lows, and do a 10-day average and plot that on the chart. So, and again, if the highs are outnumbering the lows, we're in a bull phase, and if the lows are outnumbering the highs, we're in a bear phase. But this is just another way what technicians will do is they'll get, they'll figure out 10 days worth of the difference between these two advances and decliners and they'll keep plotting them on a chart. And after a while, a trend starts to develop on that chart. And you'll know, you know, you want to follow the trends usually last for some time and you usually, you usually follow them for a period of time. So you just start to get an idea of where the market is going. If you can't see it, but just looking at some of the facts for one day, you need to, you know, plot this over time. This is another, I don't really use this, but it's just sort of combining all of the things that we talked about before, the number of stocks that move up divided by the number of stocks that move down, and we divide that by the number of stocks, the volume of the up, volume in the up stocks by the volume in the down stocks. And this gives us a factor where um, if the higher the value, um, the bull market when the the trend values are lower in a bear market when the trend values are higher. So this is this is a combined index that's looking at advanced decline plus volume. So if you wanted one signal that's going to combine both sides, volume and advanced decline, you could use this this uh, trend index. And that's um, you know you could you could keep a record of this and see is this is this number if this number continues to get smaller, 
it's a buy signal for the market. If it continues to get larger, it would be a sell signal because it's really doing a, um, a quick analysis of both sides at a top level number. You have the internet. See if you could look up, if, the, if you can find a chart on this anywhere, doing a search. Okay, so mutual fund cash ratio, the MFCR, mutual fund cash ratio. Here we're looking at how much money does mutual fund managers have? If mutual fund managers, if they're receiving a lot, they receive a regular flow of money from 401ks and in pensions and in other investors who invest every month. So they get this regular flow of cash. If they feel that the stock market's going to go higher, they want to have as much of this cash in stocks as soon as possible. If they feel like the stock market may be turning, they want to start accumulate a uh, cash position because uh, they want to have this cash ready to take advantage of some of the declines in the stock market. And right down here, we look at the mutual fund cash position divided by the total um, assets under management can kind of give you this ratio. And when the ratio values are high, it's a bull market. And when the ratio values are lower, it's a bear market. But essentially what it's measuring is how much cash do these mutual fund managers have. And if you get in a situation where the stock market starts going down, they build up these large cash positions, then that looks good. At a certain point, that looks good for the future because it only gets to a certain point where if the cash gets too much, they're going to have to redeploy it. And if the cash is very little and something's, you know, and they're not so confident about the future, they're going to have to try to build that cash position, which means stock prices will go down because they're going to stop purchasing. And since the mutual fund industry purchases a lot of stocks, it's good to have a handle on what phase they're in. Are they in a cash collection phase or a stock purchasing phase? And that's going to that's gonna really drive the stock market numbers. Okay. So um, on balance volume is another way of building sort of a chart where we look at the relationship between a running total. So we'll take the... Uh, up volume when stocks are closing higher, we'll take the volume on the day where stocks are closing higher uh, and we'll add that to the volume total. And then the down days, we'll take the volume on the days where the, the stock market is down and we'll subtract that from the running total. So we want to see the direction. This gives us direction of volume over time. So if volume, you know, if we have a million shares in the up day and another up day is another million shares, now we're at 2 million. On the third day, the stock goes, market goes up again. Another million shares are traded at 3 million. On the fourth day, we have a down day, and that's at 2 million. Now, now, now we subtract that from our 3 million total. We only have a million left. So we're just adding, subtracting volume. If it's an up day, we add the volume together. If it's a down day, we subtract the volume from the total. And we move this forward through time. So if the on-balance volume is consistently moving higher, we call it a bull market. If it starts to move lower, meaning that we have more days and heavier volume on down days, then we know it's, it's a bear market. And that kind of confirms our price trend. Did you find anything? Okay, moving into charting. And on Wednesday, our guest speaker did a great job of talking about a lot of different visual charts which most of you are here today, we're here Wednesday, so you know what I'm talking about. And this is just giving us a more visual um, tool to work with, to spot changes uh, in the pattern of volume and stock price over time. And we want to look for, what we want to look for is what's called a, a support and resistant lines. And the resistance, we want to see if the stock can break the resistance line to form an upward momentum. And we're worried when the stock... Uh, uh, breaks through a support level, which could be very mean the market is very weak. So um, look for patterns and formations to give us some idea of what's happening. So um, the popular chart formations here where we have, we sort of, we develop through usually moving averages a, re a resistance support level. And then if we could break out of the uh, resistance level, then we have this, you generally have an upward momentum. However, if we have a breakout below the support line, we can have a lot of downward momentum. And they, they do, oops, sorry. 
Okay. They do have other things called triangles and pendants and flags and inverted saucer, uh, uh, con um, consolidated triangles or head and shoulders. These are all specific patterns and charts that can mean upward or downward movement in stock prices. Um, they, it's sort of like looking at, ever, do you remember these when you were a child and they had these 3D puzzles that just look like a gray field of nothing, but you stare at them long enough and then like a shark pops out, a 3D shark, shark or a ship. Do you remember these types of puzzles? That's what these chartists are trying to do with these. They look at these chart patterns and they stare at them long enough until something pops out. And they've, they try to classify them with these different names that you're looking for these, these patterns to pop out. Um, and it can be difficult because no chart is going to be so clean and crisp that you just automatically see these patterns. They're generally interpretive. You know, some people can see them, some people don't recognize them or don't think they're significant. Um, but what is significant is developing a resistance and a support. And to calculate a resistance and support, what we need is moving averages that track the data over time and they smooth out the, the price volatility. So if we have a 10-day moving average or 50-day or 100-day moving average is exactly as it sounds. You take 50 days worth of stock price and divide by 50, and you get an average for those 50 days. So the next day comes up, you take out the oldest day, add the newest day, and you have a new set of 50 days, and you find that average. So you can see that the price of the stock is going to move very slowly on this average compared to the daily price because uh, we're smoothing out the volatility. And these moving averages are, are very important to calculate because that's what develops our support and resistance levels. And that's what we could use to figure out where the stock price is going. So here, here's a 100-day moving average of uh, some stock. I don't know what. But the signal, if the stock actually goes above the moving average, that's a purchase because that means the momentum should make it trade higher. If it goes below the moving average, then it's a sell, above, a buy. So you could actually have a lot of, lot of opportunities to buy and sell here. And typically when the stock moves below the moving average, at some point it will move above the moving average. So if you sell on the, when it crosses it on the downside and then buy it back when it moves above it on the upside, you generally make money. And every once in a while you can get um, you could sell and there could be a long period of the stock declining and then you wait for it to break above the 100 to buy again. Okay, so let's look at, okay, before I, actually let me review the learning goals and then we're going to look at, I'm going to go to the internet and we'll look and analyze some, some um, different charts. Okay, so here, the learning goals in this chapter, we talk about official markets. That was in part one and uh, market anomalies uh, that can occur that makes the markets um, show the markets are inefficient. Uh, we talked about um, different evidence about how the market can be considered efficient or inefficient. We looked at you know decision traps of behavioral finance because people have emotions and you get scared, you get excited, and you're constantly making the wrong decisions. That's why casinos make so much money because they know that when you're making money, you have an up, you're going to continue playing until you lose that money. And then you lose the money and at some point you just give up. You know, so you never get to get to turn it around to make money again because you get so discouraged. So uh, humans are riddled with all these emotions that they bring to the trading and then they generally lose money because of it. And that would be the, the behavioral um, so behavioral finance links the market anomalies because of our flaws as human beings when we trade because we buy like we think things are on sale and we typically buy high and we sell low, the opposite of what we should be doing. Um, now the technical analysis and technical trading, something that we've been talking about for the last couple of days, we're trying to look at changes in the overall uh, landscape of investing to give us an idea of, of the future direction of stock prices. And since stocks generally have been proven to move in trends, it, it's better for us to, the sooner we recognize the trend, the more money we can make because of it. Okay, so let's look at, I'm going to go to Yahoo Finance and let's go to the main page. 
and we'll call up the S&P 500. And we'll see this on Yahoo, there's something called the basic technical ch chart, technical analysis. So we're going to call that up. All right. Let me move this up. You see, I have a mouse. That's why it's moving. All right. So let's, this is a one year on the S&P 500. So let's put in a 20-day, um, and this is going to be 20-day is going to form our resist our our resistance level, and then the 50-day will be our support. Okay. So um, let's narrow this down to six months. Okay. So here, this is what we like to see: the, the stock price. The above the resistance, which actually becomes a new support. But when when the stock price here crosses over the the whenever whatever the whenever the stock price is above a moving average, this bottom moving average becomes the support. So if it bounces off the support, that's fine because it generally means it's just testing the support level. When it actually breaks the support level, this is when you should sell. So this would be your first sell signal here, but you can see it went right back above that that 100 day moving at that 20 uh, day moving average pretty quickly. So then you would buy it again. So you would have sold it and then bought it again probably at the same amount of money. But now if you follow it, it tests it tests the support level. It means don't sell, it's just testing it. But here when it finally crossed over and broke there, the support, that would have been a sell. And then the second time it broke the support on the 50-day, that'd be a double sell signal. So two signals telling you to sell, and you could have uh, sold or maybe sold short and made a significant amount of money. And then when the 20-day the, the, um, crosses over the 50-day, that's even more significant. So now we have a real change here. So you would have been in a sold position, and it would say not to buy the, the stock. Uh, eventually, as the stock crossed, the these become resistance now. The stock, once the stock is below the moving average, it's, these are resistance. It has to fight its way through. And once the stock fought through the the 20 and the 50 day moving averages, these would have been two buy signals right here. And the stock did very, and the market did very well um, until we get a situation here where it crossed over the 20 and 50. And now it's crossed back over above again. So right now, this would be a signal to say to buy. Some people like to use longer term moving averages instead of using the 20 and the 50. And this is just a matter of preference. And you need to play around with these moving averages until you, you find two that work for you. Some people work with the 50 and the 100 day moving averages as a something that confirms the trends a little bit more because it's smoothed out more. So here, again, you'll see that they're a little bit, um, we still had two sell signals here, then two buy signals. And then back here, uh, this is just last week, we had a couple days where it was two very strong sell signals. But what happened, I guess it was two weeks ago, then last week, it reversed course and went above. So right now the S&P 500 is above the 50 day and 100 days, which means that it's back in upward momentum to ter uh, territory. So this is signaling that the stock should continue this trend. All right. So that's just on the S&P 500. If we look, say, Ch Chipotle Mexican Grill. So you can do this on, you don't have to do it on exchanges, you can do it on individual stocks. So if we look at this stock, and we place up the uh, 50 and the 100, okay, uh, let's do, we'll put up six months. Okay, so you can see here that this was 
all along the stock was trading far above the moving average and then started testing the moving average. And this is sort of actually a head and shoulder here, shoulder, shoulder, head. And then it broke through the 50-day uh, moving average and then broke through the 100-day moving average. So this would have been a, a time to, to sell, although it turned around right around and went right back above it. So that would have been another buy area. And if you would have, you could have sold it here if you want to just work the 50 day, you could have sold it here and then repurchased it back here and protected yourself from this downside. And if you repurchased it here, it moved from 500 to 600 on that when it broke through the support, the resistance on this. Um, you know, uh, actually, I guess the most profitable way to do this stock is if you sell when it breaks through the top line resistance or, or support right here, and you rebuy when it breaks above the bottom line resistance. So here it broke, you could have purchased here. So kind of selling, this is the advanced warning, sell signal number one on the downside of green, and then sell signal number two when it goes through red. So if you wanted to just trade on the first sell signal, you could have sold, sold, it, sold your shares here and then repurchased in the first buy signal. And the first buy signal is when the stock goes above the, the 100 day moving average, the red line is the 100 day. And then you would have enjoyed it a nice run up here. And then the stock here went below the 100 day again. You could have sold here and not in um, ignoring that red line. It's still been going down. It's been kind of flirting with this bottom line here. Um, you could look at Google. It's usually an interesting chart. I know I should. Uh... Okay, so let's take. Uh... Let's see. I'm gonna have some kind of weird weirdness with this chart. Let's look at Microsoft. And we'll look at um, do a two year. Okay, so on Microsoft here, we could see a lot of different changes here. Over here, something um, kind of significant where stock had a lot of mixed signals in here, but finally the stock breaks through the resistance of the 50 day, breaks through the resistance of the 100 day, and then the 50 crosses over the 100. So that would be three separate buy signals. Breaking through the, re the resistance through the 50 day is the first signal, then breaking through the 100 day, and then the 50 day crossing over the 100. So you had three in 2013, you had three between January and May, you had three very strong buy technical indicators on Microsoft. And then since then, Microsoft is around 28. It's moved up to 40. We had a little messiness in here where we had um, the stock. If you would have held the stock and then sold it as soon as it, it crossed over the 50 day moving average as your first sell signal, we had one, two, and then three sell signals. But what was interesting, they quickly reversed over here. And if you would have um, repurchased it on the reversal here, and you have the one, two, three. And again, it went from 34 to 38. And we have here, we have some testing of it's bouncing off the 100 day support. So it still looks like once it, if it bounces off a support level, that's usually strength of the stock. Because that means that people are willing to buy it on the support. It's only dangerous when it goes below the support, like here, and it goes below the support levels. That's always a negative. Um, all right, so let's look at Yelp has been a pretty volatile stock. Um, you know what, I could have, there's a shortcut to doing this, I'll show you, I keep forgetting it. Okay, so if we look at Yelp here, we see that 
stock price, 50-day, 100-day, all in the perfect alignment. That's what we like to see. And here we have uh, Yelp testing its 50-day, bouncing off of it, a sign of strength. And it continues to move up. But here we have it breaking below the 50. The first sign of sell would be here. But it's been, once it's between the 50 and 100, the 50 becomes the resistance and the 100 becomes the support. And we see Yelp bouncing off the support uh, and finally piercing the, the resistance. And once it pierced the resistance here or the 50 day, we could see a nice upward trend of Yelp. But now we see the exact opposite. We see uh, Yelp coming below the 50 day and now piercing the 100 day. So we have one, two sell signals here on Yelp. So this would say that this is a stock to short, not buy, or if you own it, to sell it. And if the 100 day crosses over the 50 day in the, in the future, that would be a third sell signal. So technically things are not looking really good for Yelp. If we look at Netflix is usually, if I go to this little box up here, I think I can um, just get the chart without having to go through all that process. Okay, so here's another good one. If we look at Netflix, we had a similar situation where it was doing good for a long, a long haul. So here would have been when it crossed over the 50-day moving average, the, the resistance, we moved from 200 to 400. And now we have a situation over here we had a situation where we had it broke through the, the, the 50 and it's been bouncing off the support of the 100. As long as it just bounces off the 100 and doesn't go significantly below it, it's a sign of strength. And then eventually it broke through the 50 again, which would be, this would be your point to repurchase. Once it goes, breaks through the resistance, the top line moving average becomes a resistance and the bottom line is the support. So it's in bouncing off the support, showing strength in traders to buy it on the support level. And then it finally breaks the resistance. It would have been a nice move from 400 to 450 before we started seeing trouble. So here it breaks below the support. This would be a sell. And then it breaks below the support a second time on the 100, two sell signals. So Netflix in this particular pattern looks like it's not the stock to buy. It's not good timing to buy the stock at this point. Okay. So let's go back. Another interesting, a lot of times they do this on the indexes. So if we look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ is up 15 points, and we can go to technical charts on this. So sometimes with the index, sometimes they play with some shorter times, maybe um, the 10-day and the 20-day. And this would be for, you know, depending on your on how your length of trading. If you want to do more short-term trades within the week or within the month, then you want to use the smaller moving averages. If you want to do more trades on a lengthier period of time, like six-month periods, you want to use the 50 and the 100. But if you're doing sort of like a day trading scenario, uh, we could look at, and typically if you're doing the 10 and 20, you would want to look at more like a three-month setup on the chart. So here's the NASDAQ on the three-month, on the 10 and 20, and you could see that uh, we had, this would be a buy signal here because it goes, breaks above the 10, above the 20, and the 10 crosses over the 20, so three buy signals right here. The NASDAQ does very well. But now we have the opposite. The NASDAQ went below, um, it broke below the, the, um, the 20 and the, the 10, and the, the 10 crossed over the 20. So three sell signals here, and we've been on a sort of a downward trajectory. Now what's been happening is the stock has been testing the support. So here it tested both supports, but then couldn't sustain, maintain it. And here it tested both support, uh, sorry, tested the resistance and couldn't pierce it. So when it can't pierce the resistance, this was good because it pierced one level of resistance, but not really both. And here we're not piercing this resistance, but here we did actually pierce the 10 day if this moves up to the 20 day, then that, that would be a double purchase. But right now we only have a one purchase here. So sometimes these traders will wait, wait for it to confirm on the second purchase before buying back into the NASDAQ. Uh, if this goes down from, this would be sort of a head and shoulder. Actually, there's a few head and shoulders here, but the bad thing is that it's bouncing off the support at lower and lower levels, showing even a more generalized weakness. Yes.
if it will have to break it, I wouldn't buy it on a touch. So if I was day trading this and it went through both, then I would consider, I would definitely consider that. Now, another technical measure to look at, let me just shut these moving averages off, is um, the Bollinger Bands. And this is look using uh, standard deviations to have an average and then have a pr two standard deviations will capture 96% of the change of the stock. So whenever the stock touches the bottom band, there's a 96% chance it's going to go in the opposite direction. So here you can see it touching the bottom band and shooting right back up. And, and it didn't quite touch the top band, but it's bouncing off the bottom band pretty consistently. So if you're watching this chart, anytime it touches this bottom band, you have a 96% chance the stock's going to move higher. So right now, the NASDAQ is above, pretty much above, there's a big chain, a big width between the top and bottom bands. And it's not, over here would have been a technical time to buy it, touching the bottom band. You have 96% chance it'll turn around. Here, we're nowhere near, nowhere close to the bottom band, saying that there's technical weakness in the NASDAQ, that it's not penetrating its supports, its resistance, and it's not at the bottom of the Bollinger Bands means that there's still, um, technically, this stock could go to 3,800 before having to turn around. Um, so the Bollinger Bands would just be using an average of, of, of volatility versus two standard deviations. So using a statistical probabilities to help you predict the price of stocks. There's also something called this is actually a volume bar down here. And you can see how, see how volume is slightly higher on this side. See how it's kind of around this blue line here. And now it's starting to elevate above that line as the stock price goes down. So volume is picking up, which is bad in the downward. If the market is going down, if, stocks, if the NASDAQ's going down, the volume's picking up, that's a negative. We have something called the relative strength indicator, which I can also show you. And the relative strength indicator is a separate chart down here. It's only measured from 0 to 100. If it, if it touches 80, it means it's that the stock price is going to gravitate lower. So over here, you can see that it's above 80. Here's the 80. So it means it's over-purchased and, and that the, the index should go lower. And we can see the index going lower. And when it's about 50, it's anyone's call. If it reaches 20, that's a definite purchase. If it reaches 80, that's a definite sell. So when it's at the 50 mark, it shows that it's not particularly oversold or overpurchased. So it's sort of a hold indicator. So the RSI, um, let's think of, um, do you have any stocks you want me to look at? Okay, nice. So we could look at, say, General Motors. It's always a classic. Actually, let me go back. Okay, so in General Motors here, again, we have something similar where it's around the 50. It would have been good to purchase here. It didn't quite touch the 20. But um, when it gets approaching, a lot of traders will purchase before it actually touches the 80 or 20. So here, around 75, would have been said it's over-purchased. It would have been a good time to sell. And then when it touched, get close to the 20, you could have repurchased it and went from, you know, it's only going from 32 to 34. But still right now, I would say that at 50, it's not quite over-purchased yet. There's still room it could move up. And if we throw in a couple of moving averages... We could see that it's been trading over here was uh, a triple. I should expand this to a six month. And we'll see on GM we had over here. This is doing good. This is what we like to see. Stock price, 20 day, 50 day. It means everything's clear sailing for moving ahead. Once it, it this is the support. It, it broke the support here, which would be the first sell signal. And then it broke the support again, a second sell signal. And then the, the, the smaller duration moving average broke below the longer duration, the 20 went over the 50, a third sell signal. And you can see how the stock has a downward trend ever since. And it's been testing 
it successfully broke the resistance of the 20 day, but it's been having a hard time breaking the 50 day and bouncing, getting through that resistance. So right now, the stock is sort of still below the, it's still in the sell position right here because it's below the 50 and the 20. But if this can manage to break through the 20 day, then break through the 50 day, and the 20 day will move above the 50 day again, that would be three buy signals. So before you buy GM, I was just waiting for the stock to, to go above the 20 and the 50. Yeah. I would, for GM, I'd usually wait for two buy signals, you know, not three. But I wouldn't buy it on one because this has a tendency to test the, the test, to test and bounce off their uh, support levels and resistance levels a little bit more. It's not, and it's not really that volatile of a stock. We're talking of a range from like 40 to $34. That's so not a huge range. So some of these technical traders may just be trading for a couple of dollars, not long, long-term trends. You know, um, if we look, uh, if we look at the um, Dow Jones Industrial Average, let's do a long-term trend, and, and we, um, okay, so we'll do a, um, we'll do a five-year chart. That's been the bull market. It's been five years, and we'll do a typical 100 and 200-day moving averages, which is what you'd use for a five-year scenario. This is a longer term trend, trying to spot a longer term trend. And we could see that there's been periods in this five year, like here, back here is a clear, this is the clear buy signals. The Dow, back in 2009, the Dow broke above the 50 and 200 day moving averages, and the 50 crossed over the 200 day moving average, and that was the start of a long term trend. But you could see that even though this is the start, this is the three technical buy signs that predicted this long-term trend. You could see there were periods where it was testing its support and resistance. And we had periods of triple sells, followed by periods closely followed by triple buys. So we had, in this area here, we had a triple sell indicator. And then that was quickly followed by a triple buy indicator with, within a month. So we have these, these are periods of corrections. So a correction may cause you to reverse your position, but if the correction, when that changes direction, you have to go back in and buy. So hopefully you're making money on these transitions. Here's a second transition, and then sort of a third here. But right now, you see how the Dow right here, it wasn't able to break through the support of the 200 day, and that's very significant, and the stock bounced off of that. So that's sort of a, a test right there. And it would say that the Dow is still in position. It's a, the Dow is above the, the 50 and 100 day moving averages. So it's still in a position to move up more. But that's a long term trend. And in, within a long term trend, and you can easily see the long term trend here, that this, this predicted a long term trend, but there's going to be testing situations in the middle of these trends that can drive you crazy as a technical trader. Because that's why your trading frequency increases because. You, you see the change over, so you sell to protect yourself, and then it changes back, so you get to buy back in, and oftentimes you're selling and buying back in at the same price and making no money. But you're protecting yourself from a bigger downturn. And if that's, that's what's significant here. So even though your trading frequency may increase, you're protecting yourself from, from potential crash. So you're getting out when the getting out is good, and getting back in when the getting back in is looking good. And you're, you're, you're severely cutting out the risky periods where stocks really may go down. So even though this caused you to sell and buy, sell out and buy back in, and then sell and buy back in three times, you still have protected yourself every time. Because you don't want a, a scenario, if we do the max, um, there are scenarios here, like you you want to miss if you bought out you were able to get out here in the triple sell here before it went down tremendously and then got back in at the at sort of the bottom here when it reversed those are the times where it really pays off so if you get out prematurely or at the right time and it takes a while before you get back in you miss all that downward that downward motion and then you can get back in at a much lower level as the trend continues because here over a 20-year trend, we have a, much, we have a bull trend over 20 years. But there's been, there's been points 
where we've had significant changes in direction temporarily. So charting on the Dow helps you say, okay, at this particular point, things are getting more riskier because it broke through both of the support levels. So I'm going to sell out and see what happens. But you're always getting back in when it passes above the, the, the resistance, resistance levels on the other side. So you're never missing the upward trend. You're just protecting yourself from the downward trends. So this way you can cut out all those years where the Dow goes down 25, 35, or 50 percent. You can cut out all those valleys and just be in it when it's moving up. So if you, so you're basically, if you cut out at the top valley here when it hit 13,000 or 14,000 last time, and then technically you don't buy back in until it's 8,000, now you're consistently selling high and buying low by following these moving averages. So if you do this in a longer term approach, and say you're just trading the S&P or the Dow, and you're selling out and buying back in based on the movements of these, of these, um, these moving averages, you know, at some points you may lose some money by doing this, but you're, you're cutting out significant amount of risk. And, and typically if you can, if you consider, if you can do this for a long period of time, you're going to cut out all the big valleys. So it'll, it'll, it'll force you to sell out before the big valley occurs. And then you'll repurchase in at the lower point of that valley. So you, by following this technical trading, uh, on stock prices, and this is, you know, this is a long-term trend, you're doing this for 20 years, you can double the returns of that index. So if the index over 20 years returned, say, 400% by doing a technical trading and selling out and buying back in on technical weakness, you could double that to 800% return. And that's what professional traders are doing. So when, they, so when things are bad, that's why their money comes out first because their money's always coming out first and they're waiting to see what happens. And if things turn around and look good, they put their money back in. If things don't turn around and get worse, they've got their money safe and all the small investors are now taking the big hits. So you can see that technical over long-term trading um, can save you a significant amount of um, loss. Another good stock to look at is, say, Amazon. It's at $328. And we'll do, um, let's do a, a max on Amazon. And we'll see a nice, a very nice trend with Amazon here. I'm going to do... Um, To a 50 and a 100. There we go. Okay. So look at Amazon's chart here. Now, the technical trading would have caused you to, to have a, there would have been a triple, it's a little small here, but there would have been a triple sell signal here at the top. And you could have you could have missed this valley and then purchased it back in and triple the triple buy is about here, and wrote it up. So these if you cut out a couple of these valleys, you can significantly increase the return. You know, let's just make it a five year so it's a little bit clearer. This is the max since like 2000. Okay, so over here this is a triple sell signal here where it crosses over, and you would have missed this valley. Um, and this valley over here. So if you cut off a couple of valleys on Amazon, now you're selling out when the shares are higher. And when you repurchase, you're buying more shares. So this is what magnifies the returns. And actually, there's something, you know, we're seeing a, an interesting thing. If I cut it down to three months, you see that right here is a classic watch out. So we have a downward. And this is one of the things... Back when the semester started, you'll notice that I did short Amazon. And that was basically on these two these two um, sell signals. When it went below the support of the 50 and then the 100, that's I was um, actually talking with a student. I was showing them how to short sell. And they were asking, well, how do you know what stocks to short sell? And I was saying, well, I use technical analysis because I know Amazon's a great stock. I would always want to own Amazon because that's the way of the future. But every once in a while, I can use technical analysis to show me this is when I should sell it short because I have two sell signals. It breaks the support of the 50 and then breaks the support of the 100. 
Now, as you know, my, my portfolio sank to the bottom of the class as there was sort of a slight uptrend um, in the market. But here would be the third sell signal when the 50-day crossed over the 100. So you had the one, two, three. So this would have been, if I would have waited to the third sell signal, this would have been, um, instead of waiting to the second sell signal down here, if I waited to the third, I could have sold it at 370 and rode it all the way down to, say, 310, 320. But you can see here's the one, two, and three. And what's interesting here is it tries to break through the resistance here for only a short period of time, but can't maintain it. So technically, I guess it would have said I would have sold it here um, and then quickly repurchase it and have to sell it again. But that's only within like $20 of stock price here. So that would have been a very volatile couple of days where I would have um, had the triple sell signal and sold and then had a triple buy signal to repurchase and the triple sell signal again like two days later. So sometimes that's what kind of trips up a technical investor because these signals can go back and forth a few times before a definite pattern is developed. So if you if trading a lot like that can expose you to some losses, but you know what? It would have been worth it to to um, to sell when this triple the triple sell is right kind of right here again because it's gone down significantly since that point. So this is sort of what the technical trading shows me that I like Amazon and I think I should go long Amazon through a lifetime, but I'm not going to buy Amazon again until the stock price is above the. Um, goes above the, the at least the 50, if not the 100-day moving averages again. Because it's not really set. Because I don't know how low it could go. Once it's below these two, so these two uh, support levels, it can go to 200. So I'm not going to risk it on the downside. I'm going to wait to things sure up and the, and the tide changes and it starts the upward momentum track again. So I'll never be able, using technical analysis, I'll really never be able to buy the absolute bottom of a stock. But I've seen very few people who know how to do that anyway. So I always want to kind of jump on the trend after the trend's been established for a while. So I'm never going to get, generally I'm never going to get the, the absolute high. I'm never going to sell at the absolute high of the stock. It guarantees I'll never sell at the absolute high and I'll never pur purchase at the absolute low. But I will sell on a, the, you know, close to the high and I'll probably repurchase closer to the low. So if you are a disciplined technical trader and you pick the stocks that you know, the certain stocks like McDonald's, Amazon, uh, um, Microsoft, different stocks that are going to be around for a long time and, and are decent companies that have good products and make money. So these stocks, I don't have to worry about the fundamental value of them because I know that fundamentally the balance sheets, the income statements, the, the business is okay. It's not, not going to go out of business. So I can more focus on the technical side of when is the right time to buy and sell these stocks in relationship to the expanding or contracting stock market. And this is why um, most of the literature of investments is technical. So you t turn on CNBC or Kramer or any of these people who talk about stocks and they talk about moving averages and penetrating and support levels and in uh, different ratios and breadth of the market. They all talk technical because that's where most of the real money is made in the technical area. You know, this is what tells the professional traders when to buy and sell and makes them the money, um, makes them a consistent amount of money. Okay. Pause it here.